so I think we'll get started with Dr. Swan here. Um, so this is a momentous occasion. It's his last grand rounds forever before he leaves us to go work for the Restasis lady <laughs> in South Dakota. Um, and this is also his neuro grand rounds, which unfortunately Dr. Warner is not here, but everybody here is going to vouch for him. This is his last neuro ophthalmology grand round. So he's going to talk about dominant optic atrophy. Perfect. Thank you, Reese. <clears throat> so uh, just a quick uh, case that I thought was interesting that I saw with Dr. Katz and then a brief review on dominant optic atrophy. Um, I think it's just good to remember that not all uh, pale optic nerves are compressive lesions and not all sort of glaucoma or field defects are glaucoma and so this just provides a nice reminder of that. So this was a case of a 14 year old girl who was referred for evaluation of bilateral optic nerve pallor. Um, she self-reported that she had had poor vision since about kindergarten when she was actually it was picked up on screening that she um, had poor vision. Uh, she was evaluated at that time, given some glasses, which she thought improved her vision slightly at that point. But at this point uh, in school, she was having difficulty with reading and still also some distance stuff uh, on the whiteboard. And so had represented to her outside optometrist who then referred her in to see Dr. Katz for further evaluation um, because she'd never really been given a diagnosis as to why her vision might be more poor. She didn't report any eye pain or history of eye pain or pain with eye movements. Um, she had no color vision changes that she reported. She had no history of diplopia, um, no headaches or any other visual symptoms besides just <clears throat> generally feeling like her vision uh, wasn't sharp enough to allow her to do things that many of her classmates were able to do. Uh, on further history, so her past ocular history is just a subnormal vision that was first noted at kindergarten. Um, but really had become more symptomatic over the last year or two to her. Uh, her past medical history, she did uh, suffer from uh, gastric re reflex for about five years, which she was treated for, but then had since had her symptoms resolved and was no longer on medications. Um, she lived at home with her parents. She denied any history of use of alcohol, drugs, smoking. She was not sexually active. Um, and she had no family history of any ocular conditions um, and no autoimmune or neurologic conditions. Um, she was not on any medications currently and she had no medical allergies. So on her exam, her vision was 2060 in both eyes um, and that was with correction. We could not get her to correct any better in clinic. Uh, her pupils were equal around reactive to light and accommodation. Her extraocular movements were full and confrontational fields were full to, uh, count finger, or to counting fingers. Um, her Ishihar plate, she got 11 out of 12. And then this 15 hue color test, um, which we'll talk uh, explain a little bit more why we did this in her case, but she has a pretty regular pattern. So basically there's 15 little dots of, that ha are different colors and you should, uh, in a person who doesn't have any color deficiencies, they'll kind of line them up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in order of, as the hues change. <clears throat> and what you'll see is if a patient has um, certain color deficiencies um, and in particular we were interested in whether she had a tritan deficiency you'll see that they'll kind of jump from along this axis. So they may jump from seven to 15 and back to eight and then 14 and nine and 13, um, which indicates that there's some confusion along that color axis. And she didn't have any of that on our testing in clinic. Her uh, ocular exam was unremarkable in terms of her anterior chamber. She had no evidence of inflammation or previous inflammation. Uh, her lenses were clear. And her most notable exam finding was that she had bilateral uh, optic nerve power, pallor that was most prominent temporally with a uh, cup to disc ratio of about 0 0.5 and the pallor was definitely more prominent than the uh, cup to disc ratio. There wasn't significant cupping. Um, and then her macula vessels and periphery were normal. Um, this was her visual field. I'll show a representative picture. We don't have optic nerve pictures of her. This was her visual field that she took and so What's most notable, 24-2 is reliable in both the right eye and the left eye. And you just see that there's definitely, her foveal threshold is definitely less than what you would expect, particularly for a young 14-year-old. So it's 29 or 28 here and 31 in the left eye. Um, and w it's just a generalized depression here. Maybe you could say that there's some uh, sort of central or secocentral pattern to it. Uh, but it's hard to say that that's, it's not uh, true central or secocentral scotoma as we look at it. This was her RNFL. And so again, what's most prominent, this you can appreciate kind of where the nerve is most affected. 
in the picture. But then you can see there's just very prominent temporal thinning and as well some inferior thinning as well, um, which is uh, quite prominent. So at this point, thinking about the differential, um, you know, I put dominant optic atrophy on here, uh, which is what we believe that she ends up having. But a lot of these other things are important to rule out and consider. And so normal tension glaucoma, I'll just kind of walk through some of these. Normal tension glaucoma, you obviously, you wouldn't expect at her age um, for starters. So that's less likely. And she doesn't have a classic sort of visual field pattern for normal tension glaucoma. So that's a little bit less likely as well. She also doesn't have known risk factors in terms of migraine, sleep apnea, or other stuff. Lieber's heretic optic neuropathy, again, this Oftentimes, we'll have a family history. Um, it's more common in males and females, which makes it more likely. It also usually presents later, and it's a more acute visual change. So again, the classically kind of 20s to 30-year-old, a relatively acute visual change that may decrease even to 2200 or worse, count fingers vision, and then followed by sub, uh, a sequential damage to the other eye. Compressive optic neuropathy, we wouldn't expect it to be such a bilateral process. Usually, but we'll always want to rule that out with imaging. Uh, she didn't have any risk factors for inf infiltrative or inflammatory disease. Um, we inquired about whether she had any abnormal diet patterns or anything. She didn't have anything to suggest nutritional optic neuropathy and no exposure history that made us concerned for toxic optic neuropathy. Um, optic nerve hypoplasia, which can be associated with uh, septodysplasia as well on MRI. Uh, so again, another reason to get uh, scans, but again, usually that's more of a hypoplastic nerve, and this seemed to be more of a regular sized nerve just with uh, temporal uh, thinning and pallor. And then previous demyelinating disease certainly could do that as well, but again, she didn't have any reported history that was suggestive of that. So our workup for this patient, we did a CBC uh, vitamin B12, B1 folic acid uh, to rule out potentially any nutritional um, optic neuropathy, which all of hers were normal. Got an MRI brain with and without contrast with, certainly with any patient with an optic neuropathy that's unexplained, I think that's really pretty much necessary to rule out. One could maybe even argue, you know, certainly in an adult that it's probably potentially worth getting an orbital MRI as well uh, to rule out, you know, a small meningioma or some other compressive lesion that might be difficult to pick up on the brain MRI. And then Dr. Katz did discuss with her getting gene genetic testing for this OPA1 mutation, which is associated with dominant optic atrophy. She had no family history, um, and because of social economic issues, they elected not to proceed with that, but um, felt pretty comfortable that that's probably what she had. So a little bit more about dominant optic atrophy. So this was first described uh, in 1897, but really classically described in 1959 with a description of uh, 19 families uh, that were in the Netherlands, um, or Denmark, Netherlands. Um, and they, uh, that was sort of really the first classic association that showed that it was a dominantly associated disease and that had this sort of classic bilateral temporal pallor. Um, it's usually an insidious vision loss similar to our patient that starts in the first decade. The prevalence in Denmark is about 1 in 10,000 because of a founder effect, but globally, most people will say about 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 50,000. And the penetrance is quite variable, and so a lot of people feel it's dependent on the genetic mutation. Generally, looking at the various review articles that I looked at, the sort of consensus was around maybe a 70% penetrance, but you would get rates from 43 to 100% based on the uh, genetic alteration, or the genetics of it. In terms of testing, like I said, so this 15 hue color test, this is sort of the classic tritinopia blue-yellow axis uh, difficulties. So instead of kind of coming around in a circle, um, you get this on axis. Uh, which our patient didn't have, and not all patients do. Um, the optic nerve pallor, usually about 50% of patients, it's a predominantly temporal pallor, about 50% it's a global pallor. And then the Humphrey visual field, the most common is a secocentral followed by a central or paracentral scotoma, um, and it's very unusual to get sort of peripheral field defects. The peripheral vision is usually um, preserved in these patients, typically. The RNFL will obviously just show a reduction in parapapillary thickness that correlates with where the pallor is. Um, you can do a VEP, which shows a prolonged latency. Um, 
but a lot of these other things are supportive enough that not everyone does that, and that's not always available at all centers. And then the genetics, classically, the first one that was described was an OPA1 gene, and then OPA3 has also been associated with it. Um, there's been over 200 mutations that have been described and associated at this point with dominant optic atrophy, so there's a lot of different mutations on these genes that can cause a similar clinical picture, and is probably why the variability in uh, patients in terms of whether they progress and at what age they present is slightly variable. <clears throat> uh, also worth noting, if you have a patient that you're suspicious that they might have dominant opt optic atrophy, it's definitely worth inquiring about other sort of system systemic, systemic syndromic uh, features. About 20% of um, dominant optic atrophy patients will have systemic features, and they're associated with the genetics of it uh, because it's a mitochondrial disease in terms of the gene that's actually affected, a lot of them will have uh, some of these symptoms that we, often of which we classically uh, associate with mitochondrial disease. So it's worth inquiring about these. Uh, the deafness one, dominant optic atrophy with deafness is the most common uh, systemic syndrome. Uh, and these patients can benefit uh, actually quite well from cochlear implants, so it's worth inquiring about their hearing, which our patient had no issues with. Um, for treatment, there's not really great treatment options at this time. Um, certainly maximizing the vision that they have, so getting them connected with low vision is probably a worthwhile endeavor, um, particularly moving forward in case they continue to progress. Genetic counseling and possible testing to inf you know, inform them of if anyone else in the family might be at risk and if, uh, what their risk for if they decide to have children would be as well. Uh, sort of anecdotally avoiding tobacco and alcohol. Because this is a mitochondrial disease, there's thought that <clears throat> you can reduce, reduce oxidative stress by maybe avoiding these. And then there's been one case series on the use of synthetic coenzyme Q10. Uh, it was a seven patients, and five of the seven patients at one year, they showed slight improvement in their vision. Uh, but there hasn't ever been a randomized control trial on this. And uh, so it's not widely accepted as a required therapy, uh, but it may be worth considering in patients because it certainly seems like it may be beneficial. <clears throat> in terms of the prognosis, so um, usually the rates kind of vary between, depending on the study that you look on how many advanced to legal blindness. Uh, the <clears throat> most recent review paper that I looked at kind of gave this breakdown, which is about 30% will be about 20 to 60 or better. About 50% will be kind of in the range of 2060 to 2200, and then about 20% will be worse than 2200 uh, with long-term follow-up. And their visual decline is usually slow. So again, a lot of these are going to end up better than what you would see with like a Lieber's heretic, hereditary optic neuropathy. So the vision loss is not as severe and as quickly or profound as it is in Lieber's. Um, and then like I said, certain ones may have a faster rate. The thought is that it's probably based on the, what genetic mutation of the 200 that it is, but that's not well described just based on the frequency of things right now. <clears throat> um, these are